Good morning, church family. Thank you so much for tuning in to our second week of online worship, what we're calling Kernan Church at Home. So, uh, hey, I just want to give you a couple of reminders before we get into our worship this morning. Uh, first of all, if you haven't already, make sure you go to kernanchurch.com slash at home. Uh, this is basically our centralized hub for everything we're doing right now through this difficult season. So all of your resources and information and sermons and everything you need will be on that page. So make sure you visit that page frequently. Uh, also, also while you're online, make sure you like our Facebook page, uh, which is our public profile. Um, and then also join our private Facebook group. That's just a place for our members to discuss things and for us to post devotional videos and things like that. So make sure you join the group as well. Uh, and then also don't forget to give online at kernanchurch.com slash give, or you can mail your offering uh, to the church at 4000 Kernan Boulevard South 32224. All right, guys. Hope you enjoy worship this morning. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures. Here below, praise Him above ye heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Praise the Father. Praise the Son. Spirit now with us every moment, all our days. God be praised, oh God be praised. Praise God with moments, breaking light. Praise the 
Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above ye heavenly hosts. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Good morning again, church family. I hope you enjoyed the worship and the music. Uh, so now we're going to get into the Word of God together. So if you have your Bibles, open up to Philippians chapter 1. Uh, Philippians chapter 1, we are in our second week in our new series called Press On. And so we're going to be looking at verses 7 through 11. So Philippians 1, 7 through 11. So here's what Paul has to say 
to the church at Philippi. He says, It is right for me to feel this way about you all, because I hold you in my heart, for you are all partakers with me of grace, both in my imprisonment and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel. For God is my witness, how I yearned for you all with the affection of Christ Jesus. And it is my prayer that your love may abound more and more with knowledge and all discernment, so that you may approve what is excellent and so be pure and blameless for the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we love you so much, and we just thank you for allowing us to get into your word this morning together as a church family. Even though we are physically apart, God, we are united by you and and Jesus, what you have done for us, your blood, the salvation you've provided for us. So would you have your way through your word into our hearts, transform us into the people you want us to be. Encourage us this morning, Lord, with your word. It's in your name we pray. Amen. So we began our study last week in Philippians, and I think this is such an appropriate book for us to study through right now because it's all about pressing on in the love and joy of Christ regardless of our circumstances. You know, nobody knew this better than the Apostle Paul because he was actually in prison when he wrote this letter to the church at Philippi. So in Philippians 3, verse 14, that's kind of our theme verse uh, for this series where we got the title. Paul says, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. So how can a man who had already experienced great pain and suffering How can he now be sitting in this prison, missing his friends in Philippi, unable to see them in person? How can this man genuinely talk about pressing on with real hope and real joy? How how does he have this attitude of perseverance? Well, as we move through Philippians, this will become more and more clear. So today we're going to pick Right, off, uh, right up where we left off last week in Paul's introduction of this letter. So in verses 7 through 11, where we're going to be today, Paul continues talking about the grace and love of Jesus and gives even more encouragement as to what we can expect in our lives because of Christ's love for us. So that's what we're going to see today These verses are going to show us three things that the grace and love of Christ does in us. All right, so number one, the grace and love of Christ unites us in fellowship. The grace and love of Christ unites us in fellowship. If you look at verse seven, Paul says, It is right for me to feel this way about you all because I hold you in my heart. So you can hear the deep affection and love Paul has for these Philippians, right? We saw this last week uh, in verses 1 through 6 as well. He genuinely loves them and has a strong connection with them. And here's why. Continues, he continues on in verse 7. He says, For you are all partakers with me of grace. So he's saying here that the common bond they all share, what unites them together, is the grace of Christ. That they are all partaking in that grace The the one thing they have in common is the one thing that is stronger and deeper than any other bond or connection in the world that you could possibly even conceive of. It's salvation by the blood of Christ. Their faith in Jesus has 
bonded them together in the family of God, and it's an eternal bond. It cannot be broken. This is what salvation does. It brings together those who have truly trusted Christ as their Lord and Savior. And you know what? That's regardless of your social standing, your race, your ethnicity, your heritage, your past. The gospel of Jesus unites all of us. And we become partakers equally of the same grace that he has to offer. It's pretty awesome. So think of all the things in life that unites us with other people. Different ways that we connect and, and we come together as humans uh, that form bonds and unity among us. You know, for example, uh, I can't tell you how many Atlanta Braves baseball games that I've gone to over the years uh, where I'm sitting around, you know, dozens of strangers and I've never seen them before. I have no idea what their names are. But when the Braves hit a home run, you know what I'm doing? We're all standing up together. We're all cheering, wearing the same colors. We're all giving each other high fives. It's like I've known them forever. It's like we have this special bond all of a sudden. Or even if, uh, not even just sports, but just a music concert. If you've been to a great concert, everybody's got their hands in the air and they're, well, I guess it depends on who the band is. Uh, but, you know, people are dancing or jumping around or whatever. Uh, maybe uh, you've been to a political rally where people are dancing or jumping around. Who knows? Uh, maybe you have a certain group where you share interests and, and hobbies with people in the group. You know, there's just so many things, right? There's so many things around us in the world that, that bring us together as humans, and they're not necessarily bad things. But in a time like we're in now, I think we realize how frail all of those things really are. And ultimately, how temporary those things are. But the fellowship, the unity the bond that we have together in Christ, that outlasts and supersedes every other thing in the world that could possibly bring humans together. It is the strongest of bonds. I love how Peter describes this unbreakable fellowship we have as God's people in 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 9 and 10. He says this, But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Such encouraging words from Peter. The grace and love of Jesus unites us in this eternal fellowship. And that's what it is. It's an eternal fellowship that will last forever. That's the bond that we have as believers together. And that is what's keeping Paul and the Philippians together and unified and even joyful, even in these worst of times, with Paul in prison and them worried about him and not knowing what's going on, not knowing, not knowing if Paul's going to lose his life. But look, he continues on in verse 7. He says, You are all partakers with me of grace, both in my imprisonment and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel. For God is my witness how I yearn for you all with the affection of Christ Jesus. So don't forget this. Paul is writing this letter from prison. And he yearns, he says, for the Philippians. But he's separated from them. So this letter is the best he can do, right? It's the best form of communication that he has. So, you know, this kind of reminds me of our situation now, in a way. I mean, trust me. I would love nothing more than for all of us to be together right now with you sitting uh, in these chairs behind me here in our worship center, worshiping God all together in the same room. And I believe that's going to happen again, and I'm looking forward to that. But you know what? 
even though right now we are physically apart, spiritually, we are united together just as much now as we've ever been. That's who we are. That's who we are, church. We are the people of God. We are this chosen race, this royal priesthood. We are united in this unbreakable fellowship because of the love and grace of Christ. No matter what crisis may come our way, that will always, always be true. The second thing we see here is in verse 9. We see that the grace and love of Christ grows our love with knowledge and discernment. It grows our love with knowledge and discernment. So in Christ, we are united in fellowship together with this unbreakable bond. But that bond we share, that love among us, should continue to grow over time. Right? So you can kind of think of it this way. When a man and a woman get married on their wedding day, they are entering into a legal binding relationship. They are now united as one. But what if their love never grows beyond that point? What if their love never grows any deeper or stronger after their wedding day? Well, I mean, they're still married, they're still united, but the strength of their marriage, the strength of their fellowship may not be as strong as it should, which will have all kinds of damaging ripple effects in their marriage. But you know, I think, I think the same is true for us as the body of Christ, the church, our love for one another must continue to grow. It must continue to expand and abound more and more and grow. Look at what Paul said in verse 9. He says, And it is my prayer that your love may abound more and more. So, you know, right now we're seeing around the country a shortage of supplies, uh, whether that be medical supplies um, or just even common household goods. We're seeing empty shelves in stores. And you know what, though? Here's the good news for us. Our source of love, our supply of love, will never run dry. Christ's love for us is infinite. It really is. It's infinite. It is perfect. It has no end. So we will never have a shortage of his love to draw from. But the question is, will we draw from that love and actually extend it to one another? And what kind of love will we extend to one another? What, what do I mean by that? Well, will it be a superficial, surface-level kind of love where we never really go beyond, hey, man, how's it going? And we just stick to those surface-level kind of conversations and friendships. Uh, maybe it'll be a love that's only based on sentiment or emotion and driven by emotion. Maybe we will only be interested in serving others when we feel like we have to or we're obligated to. Paul tells us it's a certain kind of love that we should be growing in. He says, continuing in verse 9, that your love may abound more and more with knowledge and all discernment. So it's a love full of knowledge and discernment. The theologian James Montgomery Boyce puts it this way. He said, The Christian life must be motivated and informed by love. Without love, we are only clanging symbols. But this was never intended to be a wishy-washy, undefined, sentimental love. It is the love of Christ. Hence, it must be a love governed by biblical principles and exercised with judgment. I love what he says there about the love uh, not being an undefined love. 
we shouldn't talk about loving one another without defining what we mean. Because Christ has defined love for us. His love is self-sacrificing. It's about sacrificing your own comforts and preferences for the betterment of others so that others may benefit. That's exactly what he did for us. Christ did that for us. He gave up his comfort. He gave up the pleasures of heaven to come to earth and not just come to earth. He didn't come as a royal king in a palace in earthly terms. He came as a poor, a poor baby. And he grew up as a poor child and a, lived a very humble life all the way through his earthly ministry. And he died an excruciating death, not just any kind of death. You see, because that's the love he had for us. He was willing to give it all up for our benefit, for the betterment of us. Because that's the kind of love it took to pay the debt that we owed to God. A full sacrificial love where he laid his life down for us. Christ's love for us is a love full of knowledge and all discernment. You know, in very uncertain times like this, like these that we're in, we must be a church who loves with knowledge and discernment. And what I mean is, you know, it's going to take a lot of wisdom uh, for us to know what the best choices are through some of this crisis that we're in, such as we're going to have to think through things like, you know, how, how you need to best protect your family through a time like this. How, what's the best way to love our neighbors while keeping them safe? How do we engage in an online world right now with so many, you know, so much emotion and, and drama right now? How, how do we engage in an online world and communicate with others in a godly, Christ-like manner how do we make wise financial decisions right now? With so many in financial strain, how do we do that and still honor the Lord? I mean, we are all in uncharted territory right now. There's no doubt about that. So we must be the people of God who grow and mature in our love as it abounds more and more in knowledge and full discernment in a way that is based on biblical truth and in step with the Holy Spirit's leading, in other words, in full in, in knowledge and full discernment. So that means we must stay in the Word through this season, right? I mean, let's, let's pursue Christ every day. Let's spend good quality time in the Word regularly, regularly and in prayer. That's, that's the only way we will grow in our love appropriately is by spending time filling our minds with Christ, drawing from his love, our source, and then extending it to others with knowledge and discernment. The final thing we see here is in verses 10 through 10 and 11, we see that the grace and love of Christ compels us to action. The grace and love of Christ compels us to action. Look at verse 10 and 11. He says, So that you may approve what is excellent, and so be pure and blameless for the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. So the fruit of righteousness in verse 11. He's saying our godly and Christ-like actions will be the evidence that we are growing in our love for each other and, and through the love and grace of Christ. So 1 John 3, verses 16 through 18, I love the way these verses uh, expound this same idea we're talking about here. 1 John 3, 16 through 18 says, By this we know love, that he, Christ, laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brothers. 
But if anyone has the world's goods and sees his brother in need, yet closes his heart against him, how does God's love abide in him? Little children, let us not love in word or talk, but in deed and in truth. Those are challenging words to hear. So, as our love abounds more and more, as Paul prays for the Philippians, for us as well, as our love abounds more and more with knowledge and discernment, then we will know, we will be able to know what is excellent, as Paul says, in the world and what is not. We'll know how to serve one another in these tangible ways, in these actions. By being a people of God who know the Word of God, the Holy Spirit will use that knowledge, that truth of His Word to lead us to be able to distinguish what is wise, what is unwise in a season like this, what's, what's healthy, what's unhealthy, to make good and godly choices so that our lives will be found to be, as Paul says, pure and blameless on the day of Christ. In other words, when he returns, he will find us pure and blameless. So is your, is your Christ-like love growing in knowledge and discernment? Is it, is it deepening? Is it expanding? Do you want to know for sure? Well, then answer this question. Is there any fruit, is there any fruit in my life right now to show that this is true? Has this compelled me to action? Right? I mean, ask yourself, how am I loving others right now? And look, this is hard. I mean, this starts in our own homes, which is difficult right now with the, you know, a lot of us spending more time at home. This, this is where it starts, right? I mean, how am I showing fruit in my own house? I mean, this is, this is challenging. Does a, does a crisis like this cause us to have more of a mindset of self-preservation? Or are we thinking more in terms of Christ and self-sacrifice? The bottom line is this. If our love is truly abounding more and more, as Paul says, with that biblical knowledge and godly discernment, then it will compel us to act. This love is not idle. It compels us to act. And this goes all the way back. This is rooted in the grace and love of Christ. All right, that's, that's our source. Look at verse 10 and 11 again. All of this is happening, Paul says, for the day of Christ. It happens through Jesus Christ, and it's all to the glory and praise of God. In other words, this is this love, it's all happening according to his plan, by his power, and for his praise. I want to end a little differently this morning. I want to end by reading to you a hymn I was reminded of while studying for this sermon. And I think it's very appropriate. The words are very beautiful and, and very appropriate to this passage in particular that we studied today, but also encouraging us for this time that we're finding ourselves in. So the name of this hymn, some of you may know it, is called Blessed Be the Tie That Binds. Blessed be the tie that binds our hearts in Christian love. The fellowship our spirit finds is like to that above. Before our Father's throne, we pour our ardent prayers. Our fears, our hopes, our aims are one, our comforts and our cares. We share our mutual woes, our mutual burdens bear, and often for each other flows the sympathizing tear. When we asunder part, it gives us inward pain, but we shall still be joined in heart and hope to meet again. From sorrow, toil, and pain, and sin we shall be free, and perfect love and oneness reign through all eternity. 
Let's pray. Jesus, your love and your grace is sufficient. It's truly sufficient for us, and Lord, I need to be reminded of that more than anybody myself. Lord, may we take this difficult season and not forget your love and your grace and how amazing it is in the good times and the bad. Lord, when the blessings are flowing and things seem great and when crisis happens and we're suffering, Lord, whatever the case may be on that spectrum, may we never take for granted your love and your grace that we have an abundance of every single day. Jesus, you are our only hope in life and death. And your grace and love is, it's, more, it's sufficient, Lord. It's more than enough. And we thank you for that. We love you, Jesus. Thank you. Transform our hearts through this situation that we're in, Lord. I pray for every person in our church. God, I pray that you would protect them physically from the coronavirus. Lord, I pray for those who may be worried about their jobs or their income. Lord, I pray that you would bless them and protect them, God. And I just pray that you would truly comfort all of us here at Kernan. Lord, so that we may comfort others. So let your love and your grace abound in us more and more with knowledge and discernment so that we may bear the fruit of your righteousness, Lord. We love you, Jesus. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Well, hey, guys, if we can serve you in any way, uh, please let us know. I just want you to know that we love you. And please don't hesitate to reach out. We can help you in some way. Um, we're here for you. We love you guys. And Hey, I hope y'all have a great rest of your Sunday, and I will see you again very soon.